Tonight, warnings for Atlantic Canada as Hurricane Fiona approaches. The storm is coming. I'm not trying to scare anyone, but uh, we need to ready ourselves. Bracing for heavy rains, high winds, and dangerous storm surges. New Conservative leader Pierre Polyev confronts Justin Trudeau in question period. Will the Prime Minister ground the jet, park the hypocrisy, and axe the tax hikes? Yeah. Rosie is here with that issue. Facing the threat of military service, some Russians flat out refuse, others try to flee. This is The National with Ian Hennemansi. The message from forecasters to people in Atlantic Canada is clear tonight. Hurricane Fiona is heading their way, a big storm that could be historic and destructive, and people need to be prepared. Right now, Fiona is churning in the Atlantic near Bermuda as a Category 4 hurricane. It's expected to transition to a post-tropical storm as it heads north, but that doesn't mean it'll get weaker. There are already hurricane and tropical storm watches out for all four provinces, and as Kayla Hounsel shows us, some people are now rushing to get ready. These farmers are picking apples early, hoping to save what they can before the hurricane hits. When you see it actually heading towards us, it's like the, uh, uh, your stomach falls. He's watching forecasts cautiously and planning accordingly. As soon as you start talking about gusts of 100, that's when things on the farm can, can be bad. The Canadian Hurricane Centre now says there is no doubt Fiona will hit Atlantic Canada. Definitely we're looking at some significant impacts across uh, most of um, uh, eastern Canada with power outages, flooding, and uh, wind damage. So it, it is going to be a very serious storm. Emergency management officials are also using very strong language. All questions have been removed as to whether this storm will happen. We are now certain. Fiona will impact our province and it has the potential to be very dangerous. They're urging people to take safety seriously. Wave watchers and surfers need to stay away from coastal areas. If you live near the coast, you must be prepared to leave on short notice. On Prince Edward Island, officials are warning the window for preparing is closing. The storm is coming. I'm not trying to scare anyone, but uh, we need to ready ourselves. People are preparing, lining up for propane, stocking up on groceries, and scrambling to harvest those crops. You can pick that, and it'll turn red, and it'll be sweet. Forecasters say the storm is shaping up to be bigger than Juan, which devastated the Halifax area in 2003, and stronger than Dorian, destructive in 2019. And we lost a lot of... Um, Tomatoes that year, we had cornfield flattened, we had uh, apples blown off the tree and banged around and bruised. They're hoping to avoid that this time around, but say either way, they recovered before and will again. Kayla, we know Atlantic Canadians don't get worked up about storms very easily, but how are people reacting to this one? Yeah, as we just heard, people here are pretty resilient. We get a lot of storms, right? So it takes a lot to get us excited about them. I have to say, though, this one's starting to feel different. When we were speaking with people yesterday, they seemed relaxed. Today, there was a shift, and people are starting to take Fiona seriously. Certainly, the language from officials is getting stronger. I've been covering storms here for 13 years now, and I haven't heard warnings quite like this. All right. Kayla, thank you. CBC meteorologist Jay Scotland is in Charlottetown. And Jay, you're already starting to feel the impact of Fiona. Mm -hmm. Yeah, starting to see some enhancement from Fiona's tropical moisture. As you can see, the storm system itself, there's the latest track. It is almost 16, 1,700 kilometers south of where I am in Charlottetown right now. But we do have a very large cold front extending well to the south that is working across the Maritimes. And that rain that is falling Thursday night, so tonight in through the day on Friday, is actually starting to siphon off some of... Uh, the hurricane's moisture, some of that tropical moisture enhancing rainfall in advance of the storm. As for the track itself, you can see that system moving. Uh, still a hurricane, but just before making landfall, that transition to a post-tropical storm producing very strong winds and incredibly heavy rain as it works its way through the Maritimes Friday night into Saturday morning and then starts to work up towards the big land late in the day on Saturday into Labrador, affecting western Newfoundland as well.
And, and quickly uh, give us a sense of what people should be bracing for. Well, the first thing will be strong winds, and we are looking at the core of the strongest winds near that track, 100 to gusts over 140 kilometers per hour. This would be destructive wind. Uh, still looking at 70 to 100 plus K gusts further north and west. Now, that wind will be falling or occurring after some very heavy rain has been falling. The trees are still in full leaf. It is only the first day of fall, and that means the soil around those tree roots will be very, very saturated. We're talking about anywhere from 25 to 50, 50 to 100, 100 to 150 locally, upwards of 200 millimeters of rain possible along and just west of that track. This is flooding rain in terms of heavy inland flooding as well as the coastal impacts from a 1 to 2 meter storm surge in PEI. Waves potentially as high as 10 to 12 meters as we look to the eastern gulf and towards the shores of Cape Breton into the Cabot Strait. Lots of reasons for concern, Jay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No worries. With the rising cost of living hitting many Canadians hard, food banks say hunger in this country is at a crisis level. Visits were at an all-time high last month in Toronto and Ottawa. Ithil Musa shows us how that's forcing some people to make difficult choices. More Canadians than ever are reportedly reaching out to food banks to feed their families, including Isashi Ali. Inflation really hit this year and it's make the situation more worse. Ali says she sometimes resorts to extreme measures to make sure her family gets fed. Sometimes not enough money to purchase anything, so why not to skip the meal? That's the best option. But we are adults, we do this. What about the children? Toronto's Daily Bread Food Bank calls the situation a crisis. It says there were 182,000 visits to member food banks last month alone. That's up 170% from the same period before the pandemic. What would we do if that was 182,000 flood victims or 182,000 individuals without power? We would mobilize resources. The problem is being felt across the country. Increased use of food banks is being reported in many provinces, including Alberta. Unfortunately, business is booming at the Calgary Food Bank. Experts say a lack of affordable housing and income security are also aggravating the situation. Food insecurity isn't about a lack of food, it's about a lack of funds. I definitely don't eat the way that I want to lately. You know, can't buy quality groceries. Some Canadians say they fear things in the coming months will only get worse. We're entering into, you know, the holiday season where we're already going to be trying to spend more than we have. And if it, it's going to come down to making choices about food and bills or gifts. Economists say that while Canada's inflation rate has cooled somewhat, food prices continue to climb. Julia, Julia. Idil Moussa, CBC News, Toronto. Justin Trudeau and Pierre Polyev clashed over the rising cost of living today. It was their first House of Commons confrontation with Polyev as leader of the opposition. Tom Perry looks at the new dynamic on Parliament Hill. Oral questions. Question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. He's been here before, just not in this role. Pierre Poiliev taking on Prime Minister Justin Trudeau for the first time as Conservative Party leader. The leader of the Liberal Party has an opportunity to respect the fact that heating your home in January and February in Canada is not a luxury. Poiliev going after his opponent on a timely topic, the high cost of living demanding the government cancel planned hikes to EI and Canada Pension Plan premiums and roll back its price on carbon emissions. Canadians can't afford a bigger bite off their paychecks. Will the Prime Minister cancel his tax hikes on Canadian paychecks? Trudeau pushed back, taking a shot at the Conservative leader over his embrace of cryptocurrencies during his run for the party's top job. If Canadians had followed the advice of the leader of the opposition and invested in volatile cryptocurrencies in an attempt to, quote, opt out of inflation, they would have lost half of their savings. Trudeau has faced down two previous opposition leaders, Aaron O'Toole and Andrew Scheer. Conservative MPs are hoping for a better result this time, backing their new leader this week with a tightly focused message. Mr. Speaker, the new Conservative leader will put people first. Mr. Speaker, the new Conservative leader will put people first. 
The new Conservative leader is putting people, their retirement, paychecks, homes and their country first. Poiliev has a well-earned reputation as someone who can get under the liberal skin. Given that, today's exchange was a somewhat subdued affair, but it's early. Poiliev and Trudeau still have plenty of time to size each other up and try to land some blows. Tom Perry, CBC News, Ottawa. So what should Canadians expect from these two leaders in the months ahead? Rosie and the Ad Issue panel examine the new power dynamic and what the two sides can and cannot do about inflation. That's in about 20 minutes. As expected, some COVID border measures are about to be removed. A senior government source tells CBC News the Prime Minister has now signed off on a plan to drop them. They include the vaccine requirement for people entering Canada and random testing at airports. The Arrive Can app will also become optional. The official announcement is planned for Monday. The changes would be effective September 30th. Not clear yet whether masks will still be required on planes and trains. Nearly four years after the government legalized pot, it's finally moving ahead with a review of the Cannabis Act. Marina von Stackelberg explains what it's looking at after being delayed by nearly a year. We didn't get it exactly right the first time. And this is an opportunity to make sure we are getting it right going forward. To do that, the Canadian government will assemble an independent panel of experts. The goal? Look at the impact of pot legalization on Canadians' health and safety. There are promising signs. For one, Statistics Canada says young people are using cannabis less. The percentage dropped substantially from 20 down to 10. And this, of course, was one of the primary goals. Uh, behind legalization was to put in place a legal process which would make it more difficult for our youth to access cannabis. And, and that seems, you know, you know, in this short time period to have paid off. But legalization has created new health issues. The number of children accidentally consuming cannabis has skyrocketed. Hospitals have seen a six-fold increase in kids under the age of 10 being admitted with marijuana poisoning. We've done well in terms of the public education campaign, but I think since the advent of edibles um, that, that we need to do more. Also under review, how the fledgling legal industry is doing. The latest numbers from Statistics Canada show more than two-thirds of users now consume legal marijuana, but the illicit market continues to pose a problem. It's no secret. These guys are expanding. There's illegal operators with sidewalk sandwich boards advertising their wares besides legal stores on both sides of them that are operating right now selling illegal stuff. That competition and an oversaturated market means Canada's legal producers have thrown away more cannabis than they can sell. A lot of the licensed producers built an excess amount of capacity and that's getting resized. And we're not immune to that. The review will also look at the impact of legalization on Indigenous communities. It's expected to take a year and a half. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. Police in Newfoundland have arrested a suspect connected to multiple shootings west of St. John's. The incidents took place in Conception Bay South over several hours today. Two men were taken to hospital. 31-year-old Matthew Fowler took police on a dramatic chase that ended when officers disabled his vehicle. The Kremlin says its military call-up only applies to reservists and those with military experience. But tonight, many Russians are worried it's going to be much wider than that. Chris Brown shows us a country where tensions are growing. Russians are posting videos of what so-called partial mobilization looks like. Men are being rounded up, predictably mostly from poorer regions. 10,000 signed on day one, willingly claims Russia. But in the Caucasus Republic of Dagestan, where war casualties have already been among the worst, there were shouting matches. They're fighting for our future, says a recruiting officer. We don't even have a present, yells back one man who refused to go. Others are fleeing while they still can with packed flights leaving Moscow and long lines at land borders. Vladimir Putin's war in Ukraine is going badly for Russia. Earlier this month, Ukraine captured a big area near Kharkiv and is pushing hard in the south near Kherson. Wednesday, Putin again threatened to use nuclear weapons, this time to defend the remaining territory it seized from Ukraine. 
Russia has organized what Western countries say are sham votes to try to legitimize its conquests, a move also condemned by the head of the United Nations. Any annexation of a state's territory by another state resulting from a threat or use of force is a violation of the UN Charter, said Antonio Gutierrez. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky is also claiming a victory after a surprise prisoner swap. It included commanders of the Azov Regiment. They're seen as heroes in Ukraine for defending the city of Mariupol. This is good news and a sign Moscow is slowly giving up already, said a Kyiv resident. In return, Ukraine swapped Putin ally Viktor Medvedchuk, who the Kremlin once sought to install as Ukraine's puppet president. Putin's strategy is high risk, and already Russia's pro-war nationalists are fuming, claiming the mobilization is too little too late and the Ukrainian Azov soldiers should have been executed. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. As you saw, Russia was condemned at the UN Security Council. Its response came in both words and actions. After arriving late to the meeting, Russia's foreign minister declared Ukraine a totalitarian, Nazi-like state and accused the West of starting and prolonging the conflict. Shortly afterwards, he left. He has left the chamber. I'm not surprised. I don't think Mr. Lavrov wants to hear the collective condemnation of this council. But condemnation is likely the harshest penalty Russia will receive from the Security Council. Russia has a permanent seat with veto power over any resolution. There were battles again today between Iranian civilians and security forces. Days of protest sparked by the death of a young woman in police custody. Social media video shows protesters attacking Iranian police vehicles, even setting fire to a billboard of the country's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, and shouting death to the dictator. The protest started after the death of 22-year-old Kurdish woman in Tehran. Masa Amini was arrested by the country's so-called morality police, accused of violating Iran's strict dress codes. She died in custody. <laughs> Protests quickly spreading from Tehran to dozens of other cities and towns, with women burning their headscarves and cutting their hair, and security forces going house to house to round up protesters. Today, the United States announced sanctions on Iran's morality police, citing abuse and violence against Iranian women and protesters. CBC News has learned Canada will name a new ambassador to China, a post that's been vacant since the end of last year. Jennifer May will be the first woman appointed to the role, a career diplomat. She previously served as Canada's ambassador to Brazil. One of her earliest postings was as consul general to Hong Kong. A source told CBC News she speaks five languages, including Mandarin. Ottawa says Canada has now taken in 20,000 Afghan refugees since last summer. That's half the number it promised. But some who helped Canada's military efforts haven't been able to get their family members included. Rafi Bujikanian talked to some of them. Because of Humayun Wafa's former job as a Canadian military interpreter, he knew the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan was going to put the lives of his extended family at risk. I couldn't let my family to stay there and die. So just before the Taliban took over, he helped them get to neighboring Tajikistan. A few weeks later, the Canadian government started a program to fast-track immigration for family members like them. Wafa applied but was told they didn't qualify because they had left before the program began. And I never expected uh, from the government of Canada to give me that really bad news. CBC News has spoken to two other former military employees whose families also made it to Tajikistan and got the same kind of bad news from Canada. It got even worse for one of them. They brought him over to the, to the, to the border and then they forcibly deported him. Sangeen Abdul Mateen says Tajikistan police sent his younger brother's family back to Afghanistan. Now they live in hiding. We've literally lost all our life there, our house, our, our property, our, our everything. So where is he going to go right now? This refugee lawyer says Canada should come up with policies to help more Afghans. 
Well, it seems uh, a bit arbitrary to set those kinds of firm deadlines. Um, in these circumstances, it would make sense that there would be a measure of uh, flexibility given uh, that these individuals' lives are at stake. My understanding is deportations from Tajikistan have stopped. But the immigration minister acknowledges the situation is bad for those already sent back. We're going to work with our counterparts in global affairs to do everything we can to ensure anybody who qualifies for Canada's program is still able to make it to Canada. Meanwhile, Mateen and Wafa are still waiting for answers while time runs short for their loved ones. Rafi Mujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. The Prime Minister returned to the House of Commons and to sharp words from the opposition. Will the Prime Minister ground the jet, park the hypocrisy and axe the tax hikes? Does Pierre Polyev change the political game for Trudeau? Rosie and the Ad Issue panel are here. But parties did come together over one topic, hockey. Here's another shot, right by the side. Honoring members of a legendary team 50 years after they beat the Soviets. But first, a new airline takes off in Canada, launching a single route to start. We're back in two. Quebec party leaders met tonight for a final debate before the October 3rd provincial election. Merci d'avoir accepté de débattre ce soir. For rivals of the CAQ leader François Legault, a chance to at least reduce his lead in the polls. Legault's campaign has come under fire for its stance on racism and Indigenous health. Those were ballot box issues at a debate earlier this week organized by the Quebec Labrador AFN. Alison Northcott was there. For the recognition of systemic racism, this debate put the focus on Indigenous issues. It was important that we create the space tonight uh, otherwise, you know, nobody's going to speak about our issues. It's important as a uh, voter and as an Indigenous person as, and as a future doctor to be aware of what the politicians have to say. For this med student watching the event, healthcare is key. With everything that happened with Joyce, it just rang a bell to everybody that they had to do something. Two years ago, Joyce Eshaquan filmed herself as hospital staff insulted and mocked her shortly before she died. A coroner's inquiry determined racism and prejudice played a role in her death. But the Legault government has refused to acknowledge systemic racism exists in Quebec. That didn't change in the debate. More work needs to be done, said the former Indigenous Affairs Minister, but he said thousands of healthcare workers have already received cultural safety training. There is systemic racism in Quebec. The list of examples is long. To have someone who don't recognize that, uh, it's not helping. In 2007, Alexei Wawanoloath became the first and still only Indigenous person elected to the provincial legislature since Indigenous people got the right to vote in 1969. He's encouraged by the record number of Indigenous candidates in this campaign. The fact uh, right now, the fact where we have uh, nine candidates, tells me at least uh, the party uh, care. Sending people we know at the National Assembly will be crucial for us to trust um, the system more. There needs to be a, a better um, consultation process. Uh, we, we need a better connection with the government. He says better representation in the legislature would be a good starting point. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. The inaugural flight of this country's newest airline landed in Calgary today. Canada Jetlines will have twice weekly flights between Toronto and Calgary. It says it plans to expand domestically and to the Caribbean and the Americas. It's one of several relatively new airlines promoting themselves as low-cost options. Instead of wings, a few superheroes donned capes to get up high. But why are Batman and Superman washing windows instead of fighting villains? But first, Rosie's here with Ad Issue. Hey, and all eyes were, of course, centered on the House of Commons this afternoon. The highly anticipated question period matchup between the Prime Minister and Pierre Poilievre. What does it say about the dynamic in Parliament in the next number of months? Chantal, Althea, Andrew and Elamine will be here with all of us after this.
Speaker of the Liberal Party has an opportunity to respect the fact that heating your home in January and February in Canada is not a luxury. And it is, does not make those Canadians polluters. They're just trying to survive. This from a Prime Minister who burned more jet fuel in one month than 20 average Canadians burn in an entire year. So will the Prime Minister ground the jet Park the hypocrisy and axe the tax hikes. On this side of the House, we're going to continue to stay focused on direct and real help for Canadians, responding to the challenges they're facing with meaningful measures that are going to help millions of Canadians in the middle class and those working hard to join it. Just a snippet of the very first question period between Justin Trudeau and Pierre Poiliev. Did it live up to the hype? What does it signal about the upcoming fall sitting of Parliament? It's Thursday. At issue is here. Chantal Hébert, Elamine Abdul-Mahmoud, Althea Raj, and Andrew Coyne. Good to see everyone. All right, uh, Chantal, I'll start with you. What did you make of this, this first fiery exchange between the two leaders? <laughs> yes, uh, like watching paint dry. Uh, <laughs> it never lives up to the hype. Let's agree on this. Every yes. time the House comes back, everyone says, oh, this is going to be great. And after, what, 10 minutes, people say, same old, same old. And everything is actually new again from the, uh, the middle class and those working hard to join it. Remember that line that uh, was repeated time and again by Justin Trudeau after 2015, but also on the conservative side, because basically what we've seen all week culminating in today's question period, uh, is a, a, a remake of the uh, Carbon Tax is Killing You uh, movie that the Conservatives used over the last uh, term of Stephen Harper and moving forward, possibly because they know that the carbon tax is probably the last thing the Liberals are going to drop. But they've had that battle a few times, and they have lost it a few times. Elamine, what did you make of this first encounter? I mean, it's early yet, but of course, it's also theater that is not for all Canadians to consume. It's for people like us. Um, and having said that, you know, as we sort of look at a theater like that, I think one thing that sort of stood out to me is that it appears very clear that Pierre Polyev is Pierre Polyev's uh, best political weapon. You know, um, he was the kind of person who used to make these attacks so that the leader of the party didn't have to. Now he's the leader of this party. And he has to kind of shoulder that burden. Um, I think he has to kind of walk an interesting fine line between uh, being a little bit too aggressive, but also, you know, seemingly kind of um, being on message. So I, I do think that uh, um, it was a great question period performance. It's just, I don't think we're used to seeing this kind of performance from a leader. Um, usually you defer that to one of your attack dogs. But in this particular case, he is that attack dog. Althea? I would say they've all become attack dogs. Like, um, it was interesting to be in the house today. It felt different i would say that i mean it may not have been very exciting i would say it was a little bit more exciting than watching paint dry um but it did, definitely did not live up to the hype um what was clear was that both the prime minister and the leader of the official opposition seemed to really be enjoying their new roles um and they seemed to be having a lot of fun on both sides of the aisle um i would say the most interesting thing that happened this week in the House of Commons was really on Tuesday when Mr. Polyev had his first question period and Randy Boisneau from the Liberals stood up and said what we were going to see, what the Canadians were going to see over the next, over the course of several weeks and months, was two competing visions about the future of the country and what both parties think is best. And mm -hmm. that I think is true. It wasn't really yeah. reflected today. But, you know, you do have a very conservative leader uh, of that party now, you know, somebody who really does believe that there should be no no tax hikes on Canadians, who believes that this, the best social safety net is your family and your community. That is a very different vision than the vision of the Liberal yeah. Party. And so I think that we are going to see change. It may not have been fireworks today, but um, there will be lots to disagree on and lots to, on policy to disagree on. Yeah. Andrew? Well, it there certainly serves them both to try to emphasize how vast the gulf is between them in rhetoric. When you actually get down into the policy weeds, uh, there's not a huge amount to, 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 to uh, divide between them, especially since the, they both kind of moved together on a couple of issues. The Tories on not opposing the doubling of the GST credit for low-income Canadians and the Liberals, as we'll discuss, moving on the, on the uh, airport uh, uh, COVID restrictions. Um, and, you know, question period... We were reminded of some of its uh, uh, virtues and its defects, and maybe I'll just dwell on the defects for time's sake. 
uh, 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 you know, questions that weren't questions, answers that weren't answers, and huge exaggeration of the stakes. So the liberals want to bring in uh, increased social benefit programs to deal with the affordability questions. And the Tories want to have tax freezes, so not allowing taxes to increase. Those are both worthwhile things, but to hear either side, either the, 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 the liberals are going to reignite inflation uh, with these relatively minor increases in benefits, or if you heard if you heard the liberals talk about it, uh, by freezing the the rate of increase on e EI and, and CPP contributions, uh, it's going to mean the end of these programs. Right. So as I say, they, they both parties tend to exaggerate uh, the divides and the stakes between them because it suits both of their sure. uh, bases to do so. Uh, whereas in Canada, the, you know, the, the differences are usually between the forty five yard lines. Chantal wants in there, yeah. I do think, though, that there are parties in the House of Commons that are probably worried about how it, this is increasingly being framed, and it works for both the Conservatives and the Liberals as a Justin Trudeau versus Pierre Poilievre. And I'm guessing that Jacques Nietzsche and Yves-François Blanchet have to worry about that, yep. Uh, yep. that this becomes so polarized uh, that they are both on the sidelines, as they were this week. Uh, in in many many ways, and that this might keep up for a while. And mm -hmm. how do they speak for for a constituency worth having if this turns into a duel that will have its very last episode in the next election? Althea, uh, having so, Sorry, it, 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 I thought the dynamic on that score does mean that there has been a change. Yeah, and, and potential trouble. Sorry, Althea, you wanted in? Yep. Yeah, just on that point, I 100% agree with Chantal. I think you saw that today, frankly, this week, even with the NDP kind of repositioning itself, uh, not just in terms of their their kind of soft launch of a of an attack against Pierre Poiliev, but in the grouping of Pierre Poiliev and Justin Trudeau being cut from the same cloth. Um, slightly different, but both ineffective was what they were saying. And their, the rhetoric around both leaders um, is quite interesting. Mr. Trudeau is now entitled, according to the NDP, um, and Mr. Poilievre is a snake oil salesman, a silver tongue snake oil salesman, I think is what Nikki Ashton called him. So uh, you heard similar rhetoric uh, from Jagmeet Singh as well. So it, yeah. it is interesting how they, they are struggling to position to position. Oh, especially because they're supporting the government. So that, it makes it a little more complicated for them to criticize them. The same exactly, yeah. right? To get up day in and day out, and yet you being the reason why the Liberals are still uh, in power. Elamine, then Andrew, quickly. So I will say that, you know, for all the criticism that the NDP has faced for kind of being silent on the cost of living conversation, you know, the Legia poll that was out this week has them up at, you know, around 23%. I think that was a surprising number for a lot of people because they felt like they've been absent from the conversation, but maybe they've been doing a lot of work um, behind the scenes. And also, you know, one of the one of the key points that I think they should be talking about is maybe the extension of the, I, the EI measures that are set to expire um, this coming Saturday. I'm surprised not to be here in the NDP talking about them as loudly as it could be. Uh, Andrew, last word to you on that. Yeah, just say I think the Conservatives have, have their attack lines have more legs, I think, than the Liberal defense lines, okay. uh, especially since they've seized on this tax freeze thing. So it gives them something to say about how you're going to help people to counter the liberal thing. But the the attack line the liberals were using in defense of uh, harping on Poilievre's uh, endorsement of of, um, of a Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies, I think that's got a shelf life of maybe a couple of days before people get really tired of it. Okay, well, we'll talk about something that all something else that might have a shelf life when we after this. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more at issue. The federal government is on the verge of scrapping, as we talked about there, the Arrive Can app and vaccine requirements for travel. As conservatives say, the timing's all political. We'll talk about that next. As you heard at the top of the show, the government's moving to end some pandemic travel rules. Vacation requirements, random testing could end by the end of the month. Ottawa is also planning, we are told, to make the Arrive Can app optional. At issue is back, Chantal, Elamine, Andrew and Althea. Chantal, what do you make of this? The Conservatives are saying, oh, this is just because we told them to do it. This is just for political timing. The government is saying we don't make any decisions without um, having data and scientific data to back it. What, what do you make of the timing? And, and I think what this does to many to, to the, the Conservatives' argument around this um, as an issue for them? 
Okay, one uh, scientific data, well, if there is scientific data to back the, the government for having kept this in place for the entire summer, it certainly doesn't show in comparison to all the other countries uh, in Europe and elsewhere who dropped all those requirements uh, before the tourist season. Uh, so I'm not sure that there has been a huge change in, in, in the science at this point. Uh, to the conservative point that they're doing this because of us, well, they were always going to do this for uh, September 30th because the last time they extended all those measures, they were due to expire on September 30th. Right. So uh, the, the deadline was there. It doesn't uh, really matter what happened on September 10th from that angle. <laughs> but um, uh, I mean, some, someone on Twitter this week who is much smarter than me on Twitter tweeted, this is like your neighbor taking down his Christmas uh, lights uh, on July 1st. And there is a feeling of that among many Canadians, I believe. Yeah, but 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 does it neuter a little bit the Conservatives' arguments then? Because this was a big issue for Poiliev, certainly during the leadership campaign, Elamine. No, I think it actually kind of adds fuel to that particular fire, you know, in okay. terms of if the, if the core argument is, hey, key institutions of this government are not working, travel is not working, airports are a mess. Um, and all the evidence was pointing to, you know, the liberals not necessarily needing to keep our eye can all summer around, um, and then kind of finally coming to this point and then getting rid of it, it just sort of it actually allows the conservatives to say they acted a little bit too late. Um, mm -hmm. That is certainly going to be the argument that they make, um, but uh, as to whether our can was helpful to us all summer, doesn't seem like it particularly was in any way. Andrew? Uh, I think you can uh, lay appropriate blame on the Liberals for the airport delays this past summer. I don't think it had anything to do with Arrive Can. Uh, I think it's been a, a fairly transparent attempt for a number of people, a number of different parties and interests to try to scapegoat it. If you're the airlines, for example, and you laid off a bunch of people and then didn't hire them back quickly enough when, when demand resumed, it's pretty easy to say, no, the problem is this, this app that it takes 30 seconds to fill out and that nobody looks at after you've filled it out anyway. Uh, uh, I, I agree it probably had a lot to do with some of the problems at the Canada U.S. border on the land border, but the, the, the blame of it on the, for, the, for the airport troubles, I think, is vastly overdone. But look, yeah, the, the, we're at a stage where we can afford to, to remove these restraints. They were going to have to do it sometime anyway, so there is science to back it up, but the timing of it, I don't doubt for one second, is driven by politics. You want to take this off the table as a continuing irritant, particularly when your main opponent has made, uh, made such hay out of it. Althea? Although if that was the case, wouldn't they have acted sooner? I, I think there really is a battle at cabinet between some cabinet ministers who are far more prudent than other cabinet ministers who would have liked this change to happen several months ago. Um, and so, you know, at first it seemed like the prudent side was winning and now the prudent side is coming on side with the others who've been calling for this for a while. I mean, I, I think that's it's not a very exciting story, but I think that's the story. <laughs> uh, the story is, you know, the, yes, they have not shown us the data for why they're moving now. Chantal is right. In fact, they haven't even shown us the data for changes that they made in July. Like if you'll recall, in the middle of the summer, they changed the way um, testing was done. It was no longer done at the airport. It was done either at home and a bring home kit virtually, or you went to the pharmacist. And now we don't even know if that worked because that data is still not on the internet. Uh, but I think there is a good case to be made that the government, you know, facing lower death counts, people are still dying of COVID. Like the last week that's posted, 217 people died. We shouldn't forget that. But the risks are lower. There is different ways to treat COVID. Hospitals are no longer being swarmed. So, I mean, the government is acting based on the advice that they've received. Could they have acted sooner? Yes, probably. Okay. I got to leave it there for this week. We will have much more uh, to talk about next week, I'm sure. Thank you. Nice to see you all. Uh, and that is it for At Issue this week. I'll throw things back now to Ian in Vancouver. Thanks, Rosie. Fishermen are getting a chance at an increasingly rare catch, sockeye salmon, but not for long. Too many boats chasing too few fish. Why well, a new government scheme could leave some with no fish and no cash. Plus... Daddy, look, there's one right there, too. Superheroes bring smiles and surprises to kids at a hospital. Our moment is next. You're looking at an urgent rescue mission in Tasmania after a pod of about 230 pilot whales were beached. 
Nearly 200 have died. The 35 survivors had to be floated, then towed out to deeper waters to be released. The hope is they won't get stranded again. In B.C., the window is closing for commercial fishing of sockeye salmon this season. But for many, the chance to continue at all is under threat. Georgie Smythe looks at new efforts to limit the catch. OK, Paul. Father-son duo Dane and Paul Chevelle are out to catch their sockeye quota. Doing it off the Fraser River is, you know, in my opinion, one of the best runs we have along the coast. The pair are commercial fishermen and fish under a commercial license issued by the Department of Fisheries. This year, a small window opened to allow fishermen like the Chevelles to fish. But that's not always the case. In some years, there are simply not enough salmon to allow the commercial fishery to take place. What's up there here? Just not biting? Oh, I guess not. Climate change and habitat loss are a factor, but the federal government also thinks there are too many fishing boats and licenses. By the end of this year, a license buyback program will begin to pay fishermen to leave the industry. Uh, too many boats chasing too few fish. The industry is crying for rationalization and uh, uh, the way that we're going to achieve it is by uh, taking out some of the fishing capacity and the way we're doing that is through a government funded buyback. But there's concern the program is too narrow in its focus. You take the salmon boat I work on, for example, there are five hardworking people on that vessel and none of us will see anything from the proposed license buyback because we don't own the license. The government has not provided a timeline or pricing on the buyback of the licenses. In a statement to CBC News, DFO says fishermen will be able to sell their licenses at market value this year and acknowledges the impact it will have on the industry. For Dane Chevelle, the coming changes should be a wake-up call. Get a job outside of uh, this industry because uh, it's, no, it's no place to uh, build a future. A changing industry responding to a changing world. Georgie Smythe, CBC News, Vancouver. In Ottawa today, parliamentarians paid tribute to one of the greatest teams in Canadian hockey history. A standing ovation and singing of the anthem for some Team Canada players who, 50 years ago this month, beat the Soviets. A thrilling comeback at the 1972 Summit Series. Everyone loves a good comeback story, especially one that united our whole country. But I remember growing up with players like Yvon Cornoyer and Ken Dryden as heroes. They were all heroes because they taught us a lesson. They showed us how grit and hard work pays off. I recently got the chance to meet Ken Dryden, a Hall of Famer who back then was one of Canada's goalies. I talked to him about the historic series and what still stands out 50 years later. I think it's my most vivid memory of that entire series was the Canadian fans in Moscow. Not a lot of Canadians had traveled to Europe in, in 1972. Very few beyond, behind the Iron Curtain, very few to Moscow. It was sort of understood as this alien world and, 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 and frightening world. And here are 3,000 Canadians that were there, and they're singing their lungs out. I mean, it was, it was so moving. You can watch my full interview with Dryden this Sunday on The National. Take a look at this. Not every day when you see Superman or even Mr. Incredible ditching their superhero day jobs to wash windows. But they're doing it for good cause to bring smiles to the kids being treated at the Alberta Children's Hospital. The caped crusaders swooping in to spread some joy is tonight's moment. Well, the superheroes notified us, as they do, that they're flying in today. And do we need any help? And certainly we did. Uh, we needed our windows washed. They said they'd love to help with that. And uh, they're be they've been coming every year for the last seven years. The children just get so excited uh, to see this, regardless of their age, and certainly their parents, their families. It just lifts their spirits. You know, you get all the big smiles, um, you know, that are going through a tough time. 
and uh, I've had to bring my daughter and son here and you know it's a scary time for them to come into the hospital and something to bring some cheer and some levity to the moment is always appreciated. Nobody likes coming to the hospital including children even to a beautiful hospital like this but uh, seeing a superhero through the window or coming out to watch them repel uh, as they window wash is pretty cool. It is pretty cool. I mean, I usually like to finish after the moment with a quip or an attempt at a quip, but really nothing to say other than how sweet is that. And the reaction of the kids we saw inside on the other side of the windows says it all. Janelle is going to be here tomorrow night. I will be back on Sunday. That is the National for September 22nd. Have a good night.